Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday comic review show. I'm Jason. I'm Andy. And we're with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. We've been doing these review shows for quite some time yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. We started not too long after we started Comics in the Future. We're like, we need another show. Yeah, we'll have to count up, but this has got to be like our 60-some show. Yeah. So every Tuesday, which of course is the day before most comics are released, after we're done bagging and boring the comics, Andy and I, we divide them up. Um, sometimes we fight over which ones we want to read. We give them a reading, and then we present what they're about. When you read the comic solicitations, a lot of times they're dodgy. They don't really mm -hmm. tell you what the comic's about. We're also going to tell you about any major things like first appearances, major deaths. We try to do it in a very spoiler-free or spoiler-light way, though. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take away the pleasure of reading the comic yourself. Right. So uh, welcome to our show. We're going to go over these books, and we have many more to the <laughs> sides. Uh, so without further ado, Andy, which, which book are you starting with today? I'm going to start with a new book from Image. This is The Me You Love in the Dark, which, following along with the, uh, the new trend of full sentence uh, <laughs> titles, we only find them when they're dead, something's, something's killing, killing the, the children, children. Yeah. Uh, The Me You Love in the Dark. Uh, this is written by Scotty Young. Most people know Scotty Young for his art, mm -hmm. but he's actually, he's got a pretty good bibliography under his belt I now. Agree. He's got some really good writing chops. Yeah, yeah, starting out with, it's funny, and he's slowly um, moving further and further away from kind of his art style. So yeah. he did I Hate Fairyland, which mm -hmm. is just a perfect melding of his art and everything. Uh, he did Middle West. Middle West is where I really was like, this guy can write. Yeah. Now we're getting something that is very different, but very good. Um, so this book is about a character named Ro Meadows, who is an artist. And she's kind of hit a, um, just kind of a lull, like the pressure. She's kind of becoming a bigger and bigger artist. And she kind of sees now that she's getting paid for it, she's not the starving artist. It's getting harder and harder to create. Mm. So she decides to rent this house uh, that is very, looks like a very classic haunted house, just to get away from everything and focus on making art. Get the creative ju juices flowing. Yeah, and it's interesting because this is, I don't want to say it's a slow book, it's a it's a paced book. It mm -hmm. you do follow her over a couple of days of you know pretty quickly of her just like going up trying to draw something and just being like not today mm -hmm. I can't do it today, and uh, but there's also rumors that this house is haunted. Of course, of course, <laughs> um, she doesn't give much credit to that. So much so that after a few days she kind of like. Ghost, if you're going to be here, you need to, can you help me with some of this art? Nothing happens. Uh, and it goes on for days and days. But when you start kind of, uh, it's like one of those, when you start staring into the oblivion, uh, something might start staring back at you. Right. So it's not a spoiler to say. There's some, there's some pretty weird stuff that happens in this. But it, the tone of it is not... It's not horror. It, I would almost say it's like your like a gothic horror um, of the uh, maybe the ghost isn't like this evil thing that's trying to come out and kill her. There may be something more to it, and you know this is only the first issue. We don't know a whole lot about what's going to be coming forward in it, but I really like this first issue. I enjoyed the slower pacing, the more development. Um, the artwork is beautiful. It's by, uh, I'm not sure if it's George or Jorge Corona, uh, who has done a lot of really nice, like, variant covers for Wynn oh, yeah. and everything, and now has cemented themselves as a, a very strong artist, especially in just, like, the, the moodiness and the building, and, and you, you feel like this one girl in this very empty space. Really, really cool. Um, I feel like this is a good, like, across-the-board um, change from your superheroes and everything. If you're, uh, you know, if you're not usually into those, you'll like it. 
but if you are looking for something a little bit different than what your normal read are, this is great um, for any kind of reader. Mm. Uh, definitely not action heavy, but really story focused, and I really like that, uh, which is going to be very different than some of the books we talk about coming up. But also, there's only the one cover for this. Uh. There are some pretty big incentive covers, right. but there's no B cover. And sometimes that's nice to just be like, you don't got to worry about it. Just pick up the comic and read it and enjoy it. You know, of course, I, I haven't read this yet. I'm going to read it later mm -hmm. tonight. Um, we don't have time to read everything, <laughs> so he reads half, I read half. Um, but it, it sounds like classic horror to me. It Very, sounds like a lot of atmosphere. You building. know, almost in a tone of something like um, Phantom of the Opera, where it's it's not like this active haunting or this active like coming at you it's mm -hmm. it's all about setting the mood and kind of the characters you can imagine i i don't know going forward in this but if there is a spirit in the house how they're not going to be antagonistic towards each other but very like working together learning about each other and it, that kind of like slow classic horror build. I, I like that. I'm going to have to put on my smoking jacket, get out, yeah. my, get out my snifter of brandy. And <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, that. it's it's more of that classic, and I really like it, and I think this is going to be really big. Like Middle West, you know, came out of the gate, and it, it took people an issue or two to realize it, and they all went looking for it, and it was gone. Um, I think this is one to jump on pretty early, because Scotty Young, great writer as well yeah. as artist. Okay, so the first one I will go over is Spirit Rider number one. Speaking so, of ghosts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a whole different kind of ghost. So uh, don't get confused. This is not an ongoing series. This is a one-shot. So I just want to get that out there right away. Sometimes uh, Marvel can accidentally confuse people. <laughs> it's a one-shot. So the Spirit Rider, her name is Kushala. She is from the mid-1800s, and what happened was some soldiers killed her whole tribe, and she wished vengeance upon them, and of course, vengeance went into her, <laughs> and so she became a yeah. spirit of vengeance. She actually was also the former so Sorcerer Supreme of her era. So not only was she a Ghost Rider, um, which they called her Spirit Rider, and I'll, I'll explain why that is later. This is all backstory, because all this happens mm -hmm. in Doctor Strange and Sorcerer Supreme. Um, from, I guess, 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so she's also known as the Demon Rider because, so Doctor Strange, his, um, what's it called? Uh, he has the power to travel through planes, mm -hmm. but he can only do it mentally. Yeah. Well, what Demon Rider can do, what Kashala can do is, she can actually um, go through the planes, not just mentally, but her physical body goes too. Mm -hmm. Like, she, she vanishes, her <laughs> body goes there. So in this issue, she actually has to go into the mind and spirit of Johnny Blaze. There's a reason, I, you know, I can't spoil it all, but there's yeah. a reason she has to go in there to see what's going on to help him, but also there's a connection between them, both of them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's also about her own past that she has to do that. Um, so I think something that's on a lot of people's minds is that Marvel has an upcoming event. This is this is out there. This is not me spoiling anything. <laughs> it is called the Death of Doctor Strange. This is coming up. They already have ads for it out. So with Doctor Strange potentially dying, a lot of people have been wondering who's going to be the new Sorcerer mm -hmm. Supreme. Well, hmm, all of a sudden they have a one-shot on this character that a lot of people don't know, Kashala, who used to be Sorcerer Supreme. So I guess there's a little speculation on why yeah. would they bring this character up right as maybe they need a new Sorcerer Supreme. I will say that by the end of this issue, I think you'll have a pretty good idea of Kashala's upcoming fate, like mm -hmm. what she's going to be doing for a while. At, at least that's the impression I got. So I'm not in any way saying that she is yeah. going to be coming. I just think if you're interested in that mystery, you should check out this issue. So uh, we have a variant by... Javier Rodriguez. Now, what's her her steed of choice? Her steed of choice, it was a horse. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, mid-1800s. Not, yeah, not like a the, the 1800s <laughs> motorcycle. No, she didn't have a Model T. <laughs> oh, man. That's a, that's a whole other great character they could come yeah. up with. Is that all you have yeah, for Yeah, that's Wow, it. not as many variants. Marvel's 
holding back a little bit on the variance. Yeah, they they had I think some incentives, but that, that's it. <laughs> so, okay, guys, this one, it's gonna, it's gonna confuse me trying to talk about it because, and the title should clue you in. This is. And the, the copper. Look at that Yeah, copper. the Joker presents a puzzle box. Which gives me the idea of Joker like walking up to you with a Rubik's Cube and being like, figure this out. I would run if I could. Yeah, yeah. You know it's going to shoot acid in your face. Yeah. Um, and it's not too far off from uh, uh, metaphorically what this is about. It starts um, in a uh, police... What was it called? The, the Were they, not interrogate, but like, you know, we're going to sit you down in this cold metal chair and we're going to talk to you. and, and that, That's basically an interrogation, yeah, but yeah. a questioning. Yeah. Um, so it is Gordon and the Joker sitting in there. And something has just happened that Gordon's trying to get to the bottom. It's a very like classic Batman setup mm -hmm. of, you know, something went down. Joker, you're going to tell us what it is. Um, and Joker starts to weave a story. Uh, we don't quite know yet why, like, what it was, but he starts telling the story about kind of how he got busted first. Oh. Um, and it's very odd because you're, you're reading the comic. It's showing you, like, what's happening, but it's clearly Joker's version of it because there's some, there's some wacky stuff that's going on, especially, of course, Batman is one of the ones to bust in there. That's not a spoiler. That's Batman comics. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, but the way he describes Batman and the things Batman says, clearly not what Batman said. Uh, and, and, you know, Gordon <laughs> even calls him out. He's like, that's not, that's not it. it the most unreliable narrator ever. Exactly. Like, friends. this whole book is an unreliable narrator. Um, but you find out that there was something that happened. There was a... Uh, Joker says a party thrown for him. And when... Gordon asks, well, what's the party for? Joker's like, I don't know. They just decided to throw me a party. Of course. Clearly not true. Right. Um, but there's a lot of stuff like that that leads you to a mystery of there was a pretty big um, Batman rogue that got murdered. Of course, Gordon now is trying to figure out, we have this room that was full of, you know, the classic rogues gallery and someone died. It must have been one of y'all. So this is a mystery, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out when I'm reading it, am I trying to figure out this mystery? Is this, are all the clues there that I could figure it out? Because there are some very strange things. You know, you get your, um, oh, if you look in the background, what is that? Or uh, when they find Joker, he's reading a book. Well, what book is it? You can right. read the title on it. Do you know anything about that book and what it's about? You know, I, I'm trying to pick up on these clues of this big story. But uh, this is a pretty long book. The, it, it keeps going till you get some backstory on the murder victim, what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, come to find out, they were looking for a, a very Indiana Jones-style relic. I won't give away anything like that. Because this is all, I feel like you're supposed to be solving this. It feels like it's structured in that way. Okay. Um, everyone will know who the murder victim is. You know, at this point, are they really murdered? It, it, who knows? This is all such up to the reader's interpretation. Do you believe Joker? Do you believe any of this stuff that's going on? Or is this all through his twisted mind? Sounds like you need a book club to read this one yeah. and discuss it. Like, all of my notes for this is, wow, what a weird book, and uh, <laughs> this is a wild ride. So, <laughs> I will say, I think I enjoyed it to the extent of reading a book and being very confused by it, but kind of knowing that this is the intention of it. Truly a puzzle box. It's a puzzle box, and that's why I feel like you have to, you have to suss it out yourself. So... If you like those kind of books, like a classic, uh, a little bit of a whodunit, but maybe with a, a little bit deeper in some of the story elements, then it's one of these people. It's like a, a crazy person says, it's one of these people, and you're like, I don't know. It, were those people even there? So uh, I do recommend it, but it is 
you're going to want to read this two or three times to maybe try to figure it out. I was turning back pages. I was like, oh, but Joker, what was he doing here? That was weird. And um, I feel like by the end of it, it's going to be like, oh, you can go back and see all the how, pieces. How many issues is it going to be? I am not sure. Okay. Um, so it's not a one-shot, though. Definitely not a one-shot. If it's a one-shot, I, I, uh, my brain would explode <laughs> because i got to have a resolution to this. But it is by uh, Matthew Rosenberg, who... I really like as a writer. Yeah, uh, he's written a lot of good stuff. Uh, his stuff from Marvel with like uh, Avengers No Surrender, he mm. worked heavily on and stuff, is great. Um, there's two separate artists in this as well, um, which are interesting. They kind of break up the story. Uh, it doesn't feel jarring because they do kind of tackle two separate parts of the story. Mm. So, uh, yeah. It, it is very weird because you'll be talking about another Joker book coming I'm, up. I'm just about to, and this is accidental. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but it's, it's also very interesting they released two Joker books at the same week. I'm not sure what they're getting at. Uh, it, my book has a lot less Joker in it, though. Okay, so. well, mine has a lot of a lot of Joker kind of nonsense. Mm -hmm. But uh, this does have a few variant covers. So we have the Frederici variant which you can kind of see in the background, some of the other uh, cast of characters. I will say there may even be some clues on the cover to what's going down, even the A cover. And then we have the uh, Mooneyham variant, which is super creepy. And that's kind of how I felt reading this book. That's how many questions I had, all represented by question marks there. But yep. Joker, a puzzle box. Okay, so the other Joker book of the week, which, you know, he is much less a part of, at least this first issue. It is Suicide Squad, Get Joker. Issue number one. This is the latest DC Black Label book. I have to say, so out of all the Black Label stuff, I think Suicide Squad is probably the best series they could do in Black Label. Because, you know, it's a, it's a team of criminals, so you know that already they're either anti-heroes or they're just not good people. Yeah. And they're doing um, covert missions where they're probably going to have to kill people. And if they don't do it right, their heads are going to explode. Yeah. So in regular <laughs> comics, you know, non-black label comics, you know a lot of that. They're just going to work around and, mm -hmm. and not really show. Uh, but in this, they don't have to pull punches at all. And they don't. So this is uh, done by, the art is Alex Maleev and is written by Brian Azzarello. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really top notch. I, in fact, I would say out of all the books I've read this week, if I had to pick one, this is my pick of the week. This wow. is my favorite book that I read this week. So uh, in it, Amanda Waller puts certain pressure on Red Hood to lead a brand new Task Force X. Um, just off the bat, their interactions is great. I just the, the opening, like once you start reading this book, it's hard to put it down. Uh, the, the, the dialogue's really good, very um, cutting. Mm. They take a lot of cutting jabs at each other. Um, so this new Task Force X is almost all new faces. This isn't going to be the Suicide Squad you've seen with yeah. the characters you've seen before. Really, there's only one major familiar face. I will also say there are three first appearances in this book. Now, Black Label stuff isn't exactly in the normal DC canon. Yeah. But if a character is a breakout character, it's just as easy they'll come into mm -hmm. the DC world, um, the regular world. And, and this would still be counting as their first appearance. But, of course, this is Suicide Squad. So how many of them <laughs> are going to survive? That's the other question. Uh, I will say if there is a breakout character, my bet is on there's a character in it named Meow Meow. <laughs> and that's not too much of a spoiler to say, but that's that's my, my pick. Yeah, let, let your imagination run wild with a name like that. Yeah, yeah. Me Meow Meow was the one I was like, I'm interested to see, <laughs> to see more of this. So uh, why does she create this new Task Force X and have Jason Todd lead it? Because they have um, a mission to finally take out the Joker. Which, I mean, makes complete sense. Yeah. Which, you know, is funny because that's a little bit of what's happening in the joke Joker book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not yours, but Joker. Yeah. Where Commissioner Gordon is asked to do Everybody's kind trying of similar. to catch him. Yeah. So, um, there are just a lot of surprises in this issue. There are some very messed up things that happen. And even Amanda Waller herself is not as safe as she thinks that she is. Mm. When you go after the Joker... 
it's not that easy. Uh, you know, that's uh, you're 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 putting your hand in the bear trap. Yeah, is Joker is on. easily hunting you as much as you're hunting him. <laughs> there is a big scene towards the end of this issue. I talked about it back when we went over this on Comics from the Future mm-hmm. when it was open order. That is a dark homage to one of movies' most messed up scenes. You'll know it when you see it. Like even if you haven't seen the movie, people will know what yeah. this is in homage to and they do it really well it's a really messed up scene and um so uh, the last thing i'll say is is like any good suicide squad book not everybody gets out of this issue alive so but your first appearances good setup the black label books uh they don't have the ads they are um they're longer than usual so very satisfying read Mm -hmm. I, i highly recommend suicide squad get joker number one I thought it was an awesome book. And we have this variant. This is the Fornis variant that I think is really good. Honestly, I think this would have been an even better A cover mm-hmm. because it's more about the team. And, of course, the team does not get along. You get to meet each of them. There's a lot of metahumans on the team, mm-hmm. and they all think different things. In fact, there's an article going around right now about one of the characters in this book because they put him in a – political situation in our world he was part of a certain thing that happened i'm not going to go into it though (laughs) but i was pretty shocked i was like oh wow they're doing that and it's making news right now wow yeah if you don't know i'll I'll okay yeah (laughs) (coughs) i read a lot of articles i can't read them all yeah (laughs) so next up it is time for me to put on my star wars hat because it is your war of the bounty hunters update I gotta say, this one is pretty big. Um, I, I kind of grouped these two together. So we do have War of the Bounty Hunters, Bounty Hunter, just uh, the tie-in issue, issue number fifteen for Bounty Hunters. It's a good issue. Um, definitely, if you're, you know, it's not a great jumping-on point. We are right in the middle of stuff with Bounty Hunters, but we do get a lot more of that new character, Death Sticks that uh, had their appearance a few issues ago. So, great read. I wouldn't say it's like, must grab this one. If you're reading it, you'll want to continue to read it. But uh, the big one this week... Yeah, you were talking about this. Is, and I, I feel like I like half the people listening who, who like aren't, aren't super Star Wars fans are like, oh, we can move on with it. But I feel like Star Wars right now is kind of at some of the heights biggest heights it's ever been yeah it's kind of all clicking um basically since like the mandalorian and all that people are very excited about it and we do know we have the book of boba fett coming up in a few Mm -hmm. months just a few short months i believe it's december when it starts so this is star wars war of the bounty hunters forlom and zuckus these are two classic bounty hunters uh from empire strikes back you know, they were only seen in the one scene, but ever since, uh, they've been members of the Bounty Hunter Guild that uh, has... They've been in many comics back during the Dark Horse days and everything, but this is spotlighted on them uh, after issue one of War of the Bounty Hunters. And if you remember what happened in that, uh, Forlom is a droid, and he got his head basically shot off by Boba Fett, who then took it because he needed some information he had and then discarded it basically out the window. This picks up after that where Zuckus, who's his partner, his friend kind of, uh, is looking for him. And we get that kind of uh, him asking around about it interspersed with some backstory of their first kind of bounty hunt together, which does feature uh, Diva Lumpop, Oh, really? Who's the new the new character that was introduced in the Job of the Hut one shot that was promised to be in all of these? So yes, yeah, she is in this one, which is cool to see. Kind of a uh, since she's been alive so long, you know, this can take place in the past, and right. you kind of see different aspects of her. But uh, there's that. But then also, we are following uh, interspersed is. A quiet story, almost no dialogue, that I think is more important in the overall um, Star Wars world of an item being 
passed along uh, on Tatooine that ends up going to a character who I can confirm is their first appearance in comics. They have been in kind of like one novel and one short story. But what struck me about it is the kind of attention they put on this character. Even though they, they're, they're basically just a middleman, they're kind of a delivery person, they go through a lot of effort to show a lot of this character. Um, they are a, uh, a character who probably a lot of people don't know. Um, their first appearance was in the novel, uh, I believe it was Last Shot or Long Shot, I can't remember, it was a tie-in with Solo. But they were a former bounty hunter turned stormtrooper, and then they uh, left that and kind of went off on their own. But we do know coming up in uh, the Boba Fett TV show that he is now kind of the head of the crime organization right. on Tatooine. And once you read this, you'll see the kind of attention they show him, his mount. He does have something he rides on that is done in very like particular detail, his outfit, everything. He they a very specific like shot of his face that gives me a lot of feelings of like they're gonna this character's gonna pop up again. Now is it gonna be in the Boba Fett show? I don't know. Is it gonna be in a comic? Possibly, but I thought it was very interesting that they put so much emphasis on this character um, when this Issue wasn't even about them. Yeah, so. I, I will agree. So Andy told me this, and he showed me, and I was like, yeah, there's no reason they put so much focus on this silent character Yeah. Uh, unless they're going to do something with yeah, it. Yeah, because in the in the sense of, like, you're thinking about making comics, to put so much effort into design right. is a lot of effort. That, you know, that's a lot of back and forth between the editor and the artist mm -hmm. and the writer to say, well, I think his hat should look like this, and I think his mount should have these on it and everything that you don't put that much effort into it this could easily be a droid or a jawa or something yeah. um and i mean i you know to to clarify all of my notes about this i went on youtube there's videos about this character and kind of the backstory of them and where they've all appeared but they've never appeared in a comic in a before comic, yeah. um never even been like I don't think there's been an artist interpretation of the character since mm -hmm. they were just in novels. So I think uh, definitely an issue to keep an eye on. Just like the Job of the Hut had the first appearance of this new bounty hunter, this does also have a first appearance. And, and this is why we keep Andy around on these shows. <laughs> this is why I could have a whole separate show just talking about Star Wars. <laughs> I, I'm, dev I'm grabbing a few of those based, I mean, not just what you said, but what you're saying makes sense. Like I yeah. saw all those pages and it's like, why would they do this? Yeah. If, yeah. it's, if it didn't have more meaning coming up. Also has some really great variant covers. We're uh, getting some of our first of these Wanted posters by David Nakayama. Um, so this is really cool where it says Django on it. Because when he, uh, Boba Fett entered the fighting arena, he took up the name of his father to uh, so he didn't give away his identity. But we've got this one. We've got... This really nice with uh, Zuckus and Forlom on there. Then we have the 1 in 25 Super Log variant, which, tiny bit of a spoiler on this cover, but um, it, it's really cool. Uh, you'll have to see it in the issue to really understand it. But uh, this one is a 1 in 25 that we're selling for 35. And pretty much with these characters, they can do whatever they want because they were not seen after Empire Strikes Back in the one scene where they're standing there. You never see them again, so they can change. Yeah. Um, this is the Lucasfilm 50th anniversary variant cover, which I love because if you're familiar with this, this is uh, Star Tours, the Star Wars ride from Disney with your little pilot droid there and the ship that you ride in in the ride in the background. So they've been doing really fun stuff with that. And lastly, we have the uh, War of the Bounty Hunters, Bounty Hunters, number 15, the David Nakayama with Valence there and his wanted poster. So some really good stuff from Star Wars this week.
All right, so new series from Dark Horse Comics called Lucky Devil. It is yet another new comic by Cullen Bunn, <laughs> who is just prolific. I feel like he's been saving up work, and just every week we have a new series by him, mm -hmm. but I don't mind that at all. Cullen Bunn is an excellent writer, and he's good at horror. He's good at comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could do those two areas, you could pretty much write most everything in between. Um, so what is this about? This is about sort of a, um, a guy who isn't very lucky. He's sort of an unlucky schlub named <laughs> Stanley. And he's treated very badly at work. They treat him like a gopher. Uh, his girlfriend is cheating on him, and he knows it, but he just feels like he can't get anyone better, so he stays with her. Life just treats this guy badly, and he just kind of takes it. Mm. Well, one day when he is at his lowest, a demon named Zeb possesses him. And the demon takes him over, and he, all this, like, terrible stuff happens. He, he has all this evil power to do all these things and, and hurt the people around him and even people nearby. You know, um, a lot of destruction, chaos, and death. You don't see tons of that in here. You see some of it. But the whole comic is told as he, uh, Stanley, is at some sort of a group meeting mm. for people. I don't know what the group meeting's for. It's definitely people down on their luck or maybe that are addicts. It's hard to tell. They don't really explain that in mm -hmm. this first issue. But he's kind of telling everybody about this. Um, so what happens when he tries to have an exorcist remove Zeb from him? Will it work? Uh, even if it does, will he feel good about that? Will he enjoy going back to his life of kind of letting everybody walk on him? Will, will he miss that power? What I can say is, is by the end of this issue, you will see that this is a setup issue. Mm. Like right at the end, I went, oh, I see how this is going to go forward <laughs> now. You know, a very unlucky dude with a lot of power. But there's more to it than that. I have not revealed many other things that um, are in this book by the end. So I thought it was a strong first issue, definitely a setup first issue, though. It's another one where I need to read issue two before I can personally go, okay, yeah, I really mm -hmm. love it. But it was a strong first issue. So I hope uh, that kind of clears up what it's about, because <laughs> if you read the solicitation, it, it yeah. does not really tell you a whole lot. Um, there are no variants for it. Wow. So, okay. Yep. D Dark Horse, they're not big on the No, they the they, game. they won't give you the huge incentives and all that yeah which is nice they they believe in their comic as it is yeah so a another really fun one this week that i i had no idea what to expect from it i was like okay maybe i'll talk about this maybe i won't and i read it, i was like okay this is awesome this is transformers king grimlock so uh of course this is set in the transformers universe mostly, uh, and follows Grimlock, the uh, the Transformer that turns into a dinosaur, kind of a very blocky T-Rex. He, he's the leader of the Dinobots also. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this kind of picks up, um, kind of post, you know, he knows Optimus Prime. The, you, you can't pinpoint exactly like when in the timeline this takes place, so it's very accessible. Um, you just have to know he, he kind of talks like, uh, what do you say, kind of like that stunted barbarian speak? Because, you know, on the cartoon he would always say, me, Grimlock. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He speaks like that in this. And, not a spoiler, to say something happens, him and Optimus are out on, on a mission, and a portal opens up and pulls him through it, and he kind of uh, gets up in... A very D and D world. It's a very odd juxtaposition with this, like all the characters that you see in this world could easily be from a D and D comic. There's wizards, and uh, he even finds like a chicken that's mixed with a like a lizard. It's like a little dragon chicken and stuff. But it's funny because Grimlock is already a little like Conan esque. Right. He's got a big sword. Uh, the way he talks and everything. And come to find out that uh, he's stuck in this world 
and if he wants to get back, he has to help this very traditional like band of uh, adventurers and stuff. An unlikely group of adventurers. Yes, take down a evil wizard sorcerer who's uh, raining terror on the place. So it's a very classic uh, setup, but it's all so twisted with having a transformer here. So you see him go up against um, a bunch of different uh, like mythical creatures and stuff, but mm. he's swapping between his uh, his like Autobot form and or his Dinobot form and like you know his his two things using all of his powers and really nice like double page splashes. Um, you can tell Steve Orlando wrote this that he is having a blast riding it, and it seems like it's going to go some pretty fun places because of course Grimlock doesn't want to be there. He just wants to get back, but now he has this quest he must go on. And it does tease at the end, uh, there may be new versions of Transformers or Transforming Something that I believe refers to them as the Woodbots. Hmm. And I really hope we get like a medieval catapult that turns into a robot and stuff, but it seems like we're getting this whole world that maybe is like a mixture of fantasy and Transformers. Interesting. That I am, I am all for. That sounds like it, because yeah, Transformers aren't made of wood. No, so. but like, what if what if they got yeah. a, a spark? What would happen? Right. So, huh. a really cool mixture of Transformers and your sword and sorcery. Uh, a lot of fun, a lot of adventure, a lot of fun action. So I highly recommend Transformers King Grimlock. We have, uh, here's one of the variants. This is the Padilla, Padilla variant. This is actually the interior artist. And it looks like that on the inside. It is awesome looking. And then we have the 1 in 10 Santa Luco variant. Yeah, Transformers are on the rise in the way that I don't, you know, whatever store you frequent, uh -huh. viewer, um, <laughs> uh, we have more people on Transformer than we have had in all seven years we've been open. Yeah, and they're doing a lot of really fun stuff. We talked about that new one uh, yeah. coming out with the kind of the, the class division between yeah. the Autobots and Decepticons, and this is another weird take on them. So they're really branching out. I feel like we're going to get some really fun stuff from this. Okay, so from Marvel, there is Extreme Carnage Lasher. I believe this is the fourth part in the Extreme Carnage event or series <laughs> that is going through the series of Alpha, then a bunch of one-shots, and it's ending with an Omega, where um, Carnage is, so far, he's been sort of taking over the symbiotes from the Life Foundation. Mm -hmm. That is to say, Scream and Riot and all of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, although actually we haven't gotten the riots next. R riots issue is next issue. Phage. They... Yeah, Phage. Yeah, Phage has a lot to do with this one. So this takes place immediately following the final panels of Extreme Carnage Phage. So if you read that one, you'll know it ended with Andy Benton in a very bad situation, critically injured. Flash Thompson is there as Agent Venom, trying to uh, stop Phage, trying to help Andy. It literally starts in the panels. I mean, you could put it right with the end of Phage. Which is so it's, weird because this continues. isn't, a, a, they, they tout it as one shots, but really, this is a series. This is a series. It, it is, for sure. It's one story. Um, so, what I'll say is, is Lasher is in this. Lasher is the green one, the really, like, long limb, <laughs> spindly, green symbiote lasher is in this and you will see what's going on with lasher but most of the action act takes place with phage to tell you the truth from mm. the last one most of the so they're in it about 50 50 but most of the action go takes place with phage and the big news in this one is there is a first appearance of a brand new symbiote that's I, what i will say yeah jason showed it to me mm. and he, i don't know i guess reading comics so long you can look at something and you go that's a big deal it's like I did with the Star Wars book. You look at it and you're like, okay, thought was put into this, and we can see reason behind it. This doesn't seem like a throwaway yep. concept. So, and, and that is how we feel about this one. This is a new symbiote. It gets a name. Mm -hmm. uh, I think 
as long as it survives this event, <laughs> I think it's going to stick around. Yeah. That's just my opinion. So I, I don't know. But that is my opinion. So I think people are going to be rushing out to buy this one. That's some of why we do this show is to tell you um, things like that. So you may want to grab this issue before it flies off shelves everywhere. First appearance of a new symbiote with a name and all. Uh, lastly, so this Senator Crane character, he keeps on coming up in these. We still don't know how he fits into this. Once again, he's in this a little bit. We don't know how he fits into Carnage's plans. All we know is Carnage is building this small army of um, the Life Foundation symbiotes. Mm -hmm. But Crane is sort of against all aliens and all symbiotes. So I, I still don't know where this is going. Carnage's master plan is still a mystery. Let's say it's so funny we're so far in, and we still don't know kind of the, the crux of the whole thing. We, we don't, but at least this is a very eventful issue, and it's all sort of gelling, and some major things are occurring. So we've got some variants here. This is the Johnson trading card variant. So there you have Lasher on it. And as with the other Life Foundation symbiotes, you know, Lasher is just green, but you got that red, mm -hmm. that carnage infection that's been going on in, in all of them. And then here is the Scotty Young Lasher variant. And lastly, we have this 1 in 10 Nakayama design variant that we are selling around here to our customers for $20. That's cool. Also, just that a lot of these are getting spotlighted because I feel like even some pretty hardcore comic fans, Don't they know, couldn't tell you like what's the ones. difference between Phage and... Yeah, and they were kind of Ryan. created together and lumped together. Yeah. And now we're getting... It seems the, like there's a lot of covers that just have all of them on it, and it's mm -hmm. like... Uh, you, they kind of work as a unit. I'll say mainly their differences are sort of their weapons and such. Because whereas Phage, he's all about the, the, the sharp edges. Yeah. And he's really big and tough. Lasher is more like spidery. It, he's got those like arms that he uses. Kind of the almost like Doc Ock arms mm -hmm. or uh, Iron Spider right. limbs they have. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it is time for our update with one of the hottest books yes. coming out. Nice House on the Lake. This is Nice House on the Lake number three. So it's pretty amazing how this book has taken off. And it has a good pedigree. I believe that is the one of the big things that has allowed it to take off so fast. But uh, we even had someone here today and they were like, I had to come in early. I had to get my Nice House on the Lake <laughs> fix. And it's like, wow, it's already created uh, addictions. But um, so I have to say, this possibly is my favorite issue so far wow. getting better That's getting better That's because great. i feel like the the world they've set up with the nice house with walter who has gathered all these people to this house all these people who've known him throughout his life uh and basically said hey the world's basically being destroyed around this kind of bubble i've put you in but you can live here and have a great time in this nice house. You got this lake right here. I've got all your favorite foods and movies and everything. Um, enjoy, enjoy yourself. But of course, the people who are there are like, this is horrifying and super uncomfortable because we're, you know, we've got all this stuff going on there. We've got family and friends and right. stuff outside. So how can we just be like, oh, okay, well, good for us. Um, and this issue, why I feel like it's so strong, is it explores um, kind of how the different characters feel about what's going on. So you have some that are basically like, what can we do? They found out that there's kind of this like invisible force field around it, you know, their perimeter that they can go to. Um, they found that out in the last one. And some are like, there's nothing we can really do, so why don't we try to enjoy ourselves? And then, of course, you have this character named uh, Sam, who I'm just now learning their names because they were all introduced so fast yeah, there's a lot of in them. the beginning. Right. That is, he's not, he's kind of like, how can y'all do this? Like, we've got to figure out how to get out of here. And we follow him as he's basically mapping out the entire place, which I loved. I, I think one of the coolest things about this is the mysteries about the house 
and the stuff that's around it there's these weird statues mm. we found out uh, in the previous issue when you touch these statues or you touch this one statue you see um what's going on kind of back home for you and they've been seeing these horrific things and fire and their homes being destroyed and so that's really messed them up but there's more statues than that so uh there's even a few pages in this issue where you see like his hand-drawn map and like little notes next to different things he's found about like what's this uh is there any significance how this one thing relates to this other thing and it's kind of uh what a reader would be thinking of like what is all this stuff and everything which is super fun i love this kind of mystery that's going on within this book but i'll say it's got a uh, it does do some of the flashback you learn more about um sam and his relationship with walter growing up and everything and by the end of it, I mean, the mysteries get even deeper, but in super cool ways. And other elements are brought into this world that people are going to be talking about and speculating about that are really, really cool. So really good issue of Nice House on the Lake. It's one of those, after you finish one, you just want the next one. Um, very almost like Lost vibes where you have these like weird things and you're like, I know we're going to find out what that is. Um, it gives your mind something to chew on. Though. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're trying to figure out as well as the people there. Um, so we also have, which I love how the variants um, reflect. At first they seem confusing, but they they do reflect what's going on in the story. So this is the Ward variant. For Nice House on the Lake, number three. Definitely don't miss it. All right. So also from DC, I read Batman issue 111, also by James Tynion, <laughs> writer of Nice House on the Lake. So uh, this issue takes us closer to both Fear State and Future State. Mm. Significantly closer based on what happens in this issue. Um, so let's check out the cover here. We have Batman, and he's standing in front of Miracle Molly and Squeak as guns are pointed at them. You mm. know, he's protecting them. You can see that. And I have to say that is sort of the beginning of this issue. Because in last issue, the magistrate's soldiers were trying to arrest the Unsanity Collective who were being framed for causing a lot of explosions through Gotham. It's all part of Scarecrow's plan. Mm -hmm. This is all previous issue stuff, so <laughs> sorry if, if, you, if you're not keeping up. i got to say this, otherwise I can't talk about the book. Um, so, you know, S Scarecrow was uh, hired by Simon Saint to get everybody scared so that Mayor Nakoma uh, or um, Mayor N Nakano. Nakano, yeah. yeah. I know how his name's spelled. You know, when you read, you don't say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Mayor Nakano, uh, trying to get him to give the magistrate the powers that they're going to eventually wield in future state. We know that's where things are going to mm -hmm. go. Um, so as the magistrate soldiers are trying to round out up the Unsanity Collective, last issue ended with Batman kind of showing up, and he's going to try to help them. But what I'll say is, is Batman is not alone. We'll have to read the issue mm -hmm. to see who else is there. And uh, the other characters have some really cool interactions that I enjoyed quite a bit. Um, so we get a lot more Miracle Molly this issue. If, if she's a character you're interested in, she has a big part in this issue. We actually learn a couple more minor powers that she has that I found very interesting. Uh, some things happen with Squeak as well. Mm. When uh, Batman 108 came out, I told everyone, yeah, Miracle Molly's a big deal, but the Squeak character... I had a feeling something more was going to go on with her. Yeah. Uh, whenever they introduce these sort of like cutesy young characters. And I, th I think that that's starting to come to fruition now. Um, so the situation at the beginning is pretty dire. And um, that all has a resolution in this issue. Now, there's a secondary story going on with Simon Saint and Scarecrow, because so far it seems like things are going well for mm -hmm. Simon Saint's plan. But uh, we get to see them finally actually interact. You actually get to see Simon Saint talking with Scarecrow, which Scarecrow's kind of been in the background mm -hmm. through a lot of these issues. And um, 
there are some surprises that Saint doesn't see coming. That's what I'll say. Uh, there's also a potential minor death in this issue. This issue is packed full of stuff, yeah. so I'm, I'm having to like look at my notes here to make sure <laughs> I'm not missing stuff. There's a potential minor death in this issue. Um, th really, the big things that happen, more happen on the sidelines with uh, Mayor Nakona, uh, Scarecrow, Simon Saint, and Peacemaker 01. Mm. More happens with them than actually with Batman this issue, even though he's in it quite a bit. Yeah. So a, a lot of a lot of pro plot progression and things going on, particularly related to Fear State and Future State, which I just feel like is right around the corner yeah. after this issue. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next one because something happens in this one. I want to see how it plays mm -hmm. out. There is, of course, the B story. They keep doing these B stories with Ghostmaker showing more of his ro his old robes gallery. Yeah. They keep building up this robes gallery. So uh, this time it's a character who is into pain, sort of Hellraiser style. So that's uh, my... Review of Batman without revealing too much. Uh, you, gotta, you gotta catch people up and then talk a little bit about it. Here is the Federici variant. It's dark, so it might be a little hard to see, but... Batman lounging. Yeah. And then we have the Perio Suicide Squad variant. That's, I think, one of the best yeah. of the Suicide Squad variants that DC's been doing. So next up, I have the next issue of X-Men. Number two. Number two. Yeah. yeah. So I really, I, I had fallen out of X-Men for a little while, just reading here and there. And then you, Hellfire you Gala. at the gala, yeah. The gala, I thought, was so good, so strong, and, and had so many cool twists and turns. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm back on. And... When I heard that uh, Jerry Duggan was doing X-Men, I was like, okay. Because I feel like some, his stuff has been some of the strongest coming out of X-Men. Yep. So, issue one, we have this brand new team of X-Men, which are interesting because they... I feel like they're not as pretentious as the, the rest of the mutants on Krakoa. These uh, are a little bit more... Um, I don't know... Like, you haven't seen this, they, they socialize outside of mutants. I feel like now, like, mutants are like, uh-uh, we're only... Right. Uh, you, there's a card game that has um, Gambit, Rhino, and The Thing. <laughs> and it's really funny that it's like, there's a hero, a villain, and an X-Men, and it's like, I don't know, but we're on our downtime, so we're just playing cards. and so, so it's really fun. It has a lot of humor to it. I feel like Gambit would easily win that card game. You would... Or he'd just blow the cards up. He'd blow the cards up, or he's got, like, 15 cards stuffed that, up that's his, what I'm of thinking, his, his trench know. coat. Um, but we also found out in the first issue that there is a character named uh, Cordyceps Jones, which is a very odd character. He's an alien. He's got kind of a mushroom head. And... There's he's got a casino, and in it he is having a contest to see who can wipe out humanity. So in the first one, the first thing that the X Men go up against, where they kind of create this like mech suit to fight it, right. this giant monster was one of the contestants' ways of trying to take out humanity, and the X Men stopped them. Well, the next person's up to bat, and they have something that they are going to attack with that is very familiar to Marvel fans. I'm not going to give it away, but it's something that an entire event has taken place around before, an entire crossover event these people have, and uh, it's a pretty big deal. So what I like about this series so far, only the second issue, very classic X-Men feeling. It's not like, we're not already trying to build up to, you know, the, the X-Men have to save the world. It's, it's kind of like how they used to deal with, like, Arcade or uh, Mojo. It, it was, like, these very isolated villains and stuff. And I feel like they're starting off... I don't know if this Cordyceps Jones story is going to be the big one to take down the X-Men. But I feel like it's um, a fun kind of nod to classic X-Men stories. So I really like that. But there is also a uh, a... You, your kind of main story ends, 
and then it cuts to another scene, which I feel like is your your classic um, seeding of a bigger story. And in this, I show Jason this. Yeah. It's a very odd scene, um, especially when you read it, that introduces what, I mean, I did some deep diving, I believe is a new character. Yeah, it, it seems to be a new character. Yeah, there's the only reports on it are tied back to this issue. Yep. So um, there's a new character who is a very scary and they also have a kind of a, a hench person, a, a sidekick that is very weird, a kind of an amalgamation of two animals. Uh, you'll just have to see it. Sort of Isle of Dr. Moreau. Yeah, you get a lot of that. Uh, this creature. character may even be a doctor of some sort. So uh, we'll have to see. But you do not see their face. You do not see this new character's face. Um, intentionally, like, there's a scene where a lamp is obscuring their face. And then you see the back of their head. And one scene, they're in shadow. Um, but the uh, what makes me think they're going to be big is where a lot of these kind of post-Hickman um, X-Men books do kind of like a heavy text page that are like either an email or a, a graph or something. This one is by that character talking about some stuff that uh, may be going down. So I would say maybe not first appearance. I'd say first appearance for their, uh, their sidekick. You do get a good look at them. But maybe cameo yeah, for the like other one? Yeah, cameo for sure. Almost like no, how no first... Good cameo yeah. of apocalypse he's like in shroud and mm -hmm. everything think of that as kind of the the uh how you see them and you do get the character's name too because yeah. of what they're writing i think right yeah and the their their sidekick does refer to them by name okay. um but it's a very disturbing scene it's very idyllic and then it, it turns it turns really bad but uh really fun issue i'm excited to see where it goes it there is some progression in kind of the X-Men finding out why there's been all these attacks. But I also like that you don't have to be reading all the other X titles to fully enjoy this. As long as you have a, a rough understanding of the, you know, Araco, which is Mars, right. where the X-Men are now, or where the, the rest of the mutants are, the X-Men are not on Mars, um, then, and that's only briefly mentioned, then this is very easy to get into. And you're only on issue two. So definitely can can jump on board very easily, like I did, and really, really enjoy it. The art is awesome, Pepe Larraz's art. But we've got some very nice variant covers. So we have the Inhyuk Lee, where he's doing these over a couple of different series. Is that, is that Psylocke? Uh, this is Armor. Armor, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I, thought, I was like, Psylocke got her hair. <laughs> Psylocke cover. is on another cover. Uh, then we have the Dodderman kind of trading card, I think this is trading card Rogue yep. cover, who is on the team, which her banter with Gambit, as always, is really, really fun. And then we have the 1 in 25 Asrar variant that we are selling for 20. There's also a really interesting scene between uh, Jean Grey and Sink that uh, shows a lot of progression for the character of Sink that I didn't know a whole lot about, but... Uh, is, mm. is quickly becoming a very interesting character for me. So, All right, science fiction fans, I have a neat comic for you. <laughs> so from AWA comes the comic Not All Robots. It is written by Mark Russell with art by Mike Diodata. So let's talk about what this book is all about. So this is set in the year 2056, and it takes place in the bubble city of Atlanta meaning Atlanta now has a dome over it. So uh, our shop, with traffic. <laughs> our, our shop, we're here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Atlanta's actually just two hours south of us. Yeah. So I always like when things are in Atlanta. It's, it's always like, oh, we'd be it's close Walking to that. Dead is always like, I know that road. Yeah. I know that building. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we end up going through Atlanta quite a bit. <laughs> um, so this takes place in 2056 in the Atlanta bubble city because humanity has sort of trashed the earth. And um, we now have robots and AI, and the robots have take, been taking care of us for a while. In fact, it's gotten to where every household has a robot that pretty much takes care of mm. the humans. And uh, some of this is told through a talk show that some humans are watching. And the talk show is two robots having a talk show, <laughs> and they have a token human. 
and they talk about, you know, um, we robots, do we really need these humans anymore? And what do you think, token humans? So, I mean, if you like situations like that, that that's some of what is uh, very Wally in, in this book. Yeah, so um, the story otherwise, it, it follows one particular family, and they disagree about how they feel about their robot because their robot comes home from work. So instead of them going to work, the robot goes to the factory and works. And when the robot com comes home, he's very cold to the family. He goes out to the shed, and he just does his own thing. <laughs> and so the dad loves the robot. He thinks it's great. The kids fear the robot. The kids are like, what's this robot it's doing <laughs> yeah, in the shed? Well, we get this story from both the human side and the robot side. So you have the, the humans talking about, I guess, our obsolescence in a mm -hmm. way. And then you also follow that robot as he goes to work and talks with his robot friends. <laughs> and the robot friends talk about their empathy chips and how there are ways to turn it off and how maybe your life would be better if you mm. didn't you know, care for your humans at all. Um, so that, that is generally the setup. Uh, I like that it's handling both sides mm -hmm. of this, this sort of issue in this environment. So that is, that, that's the most I'll tell you. That's, that's the setup. You'll just have to read to see, is this robot going to keep liking his family? Is he going to turn against them? Uh, I will not tell you. What's the tone of it? Is it like it, kind it is, of suspense? It, it is the tone of it. It is not really comedic, you know. Some of the things, I guess, I find humorous because the situation is strange and yeah. weird and we could possibly be there someday. I would say it is um, drama with some suspense. Okay. That's what I would say. And it has this variant that Diodata, the interior artist, does. That's straight up humor. Yeah. <laughs> that, that one definitely yeah. is. So. Cool. Well, it is time for the final part of Skybound X. It leaves as soon as it arrives. Yeah. Uh, I've been so excited about this series, <clears throat> and we finally get an end to our main story, Rick Grimes 2000, which does not disappoint. Uh, it is very reminiscent of the end of Walking Dead. There's a scene that is very... Um, you, if you've read the last issue of Walking Dead, you'll definitely see parallels to it, which I thought was pretty cool. But we do find out what is in the future of this um, this world, and I won't give away what it is. But it just, you know, basically Kirkman's like, I can do whatever I want to do. So it just goes full out there, and it's really fun. Uh, I'll say it does not necessarily leave room for any kind of continuation. If it did, it it wouldn't feel like a need to be Walking Dead related anymore. It, you know, pretty much all the stuff that's to do with that is done with. It would just be the characters by name. So this is a pretty definite end to uh, the Rick Grimes 2000 story, but it's great. It's fun. Every issue it's been great. Um, but the other big thing in this issue is this is the first story from a new series launching from Robert Kirkman and Jason Howard doing the art. The classic team that worked on Astounding Wolfman, great book, uh, and Super Dinosaur that uh, is really cool. It's, it's a little hard to explain. So it's called Code, C-O-D-E. It stands for Combat Orb Defense Engines. Right. And it's set in this, like, uh, technopocalypse future where uh, we're not quite, because this is just kind of a snippet of the big story. Don't quite yet know what caused this or anything. But uh, to help and save humanity, there's these orbs that these people get that give them... Um, this kind of like mech suit armor. It's not big mech suit. It's like, you know, it makes you a little bit taller or whatever, but it's pretty bulky. And uh, it kind of interacts with each of them a different way. There is seven of these people who have the orbs. They're from different um, kind of 
tribes or however humanity has broken up at this point into different things. They don't get along. That's where a lot of the uh, the dialogue and stuff come from. This is kind of their spats in between each other. But it's it's very reminiscent of um, a hint of Power Rangers. Just how they they're like this team. They've each kind of got their own color. Um, very like manga video game looking too. Kind of uh, a um, Evangelion type suits and everything. And they have a mission to save humanity, and they have to work together um, fighting crazy uh, techno monsters in the, what they call the Badlands to uh, find something. You're kind of classic MacGuffin. But the fun in this definitely comes from the dialogue, the action, and kind of what each of their, their special things are. So I'm excited for this series. It's definitely Robert Kirkman. It's got his great very human dialogue people you know they're they're characters you could tell the character just by the way they speak they all have a very different voice and that would be all of their first appearances yeah all their first appearances and of course skybound x is not going to be collected right so so this, this is, is basically issue, your only unless way they second print it or something unless they second print it but this is your i mean this will still be considered the first appearance right. uh is in this one so this is a pretty big one to jump on because, I mean, it's a Kirkman property. It's fun. I could see this. If it was a live-action thing, the budget would be pretty high because even the landscape is very techno and the suits they wear. I could see this being a really cool, like... Uh, Sounds animated. Possibly. Well, you know, um, if they were to do it. Kirkman signed the deal with uh, Amazon, like with um, Invincible, to right. have these properties developed there i could easily see this being something like invincible or maybe a, a cg type show but it is very much set up for maybe something like that so you'll definitely want to pick this up um for spec reasons and it's a cool read and if you're planning on reading the series when it comes out later you're going to want to have because this is a good introduction to the world and the characters in it. Right. So we do have some variants for it. We have the Schweizer variant because this also does have two other stories in it. It has uh, one for the um, six sidekicks of Trigger Keaton, that new image series that started not too long ago. It has a short story from that. And a story from Gasolina, which was a series from a little while ago. Right. That's very interesting. It has a very disturbing mermaid in it. I'll just say that. You'll you'll have to read it to see. Um, and then we have what might be the biggest one, because this will be your first cover appearance of a character from Code. That's kind of what the interior art looks like for it. That's one of your characters that wields the orb. Can you see it? Yeah, it's kind of floating there under his arm. A lot of them have it like hooked to their back. One guy has it on a staff. So very like distinct characters. But that is the Howard cover that is goes with Code, the new series. Then we have uh, the one in ten Schweizer black and white cover that we are selling for fifteen. We have the one in ten Howard that we are selling for 15, the black and white. And then I wanted to also show that this came out. This is the second printing of number one with Clementine on the cover. And this is by the artist we talked about just a little bit earlier, Corona. So new cover for a second printing of number one. So I read Deadpool, Black, White, and Blood number one. So that's the latest in the comics that do all the coloring in just three colors. I think Deadpool is a good choice for this because he is the merc with the mouth and he's also the merc that gets hurt a lot and hurts <laughs> others a lot. His books are pretty ripe with blood. I'd say most of it being his <laughs> yeah. uh, from the Deadpool I've read. So this issue was, was great. I quite enjoyed it. It has three stories in it, and all I'll do is I'll tell you the premise of each one, and you'll know immediately if you want to pick this up or not. The first story is written by Tom Taylor with art by Phil Noto, and in it, it has Deadpool and Honey Badger as they go up against zombie animals. Oh, fun. So, just your first story. 
Your second story is written by Ed Bryson with art by Wilse Portecchio. And in that, Deadpool goes on an epic quest when he finds out that a classic comedy movie that he really likes, he remembers this little classic comedy he loved as a, in his youth, it's not available to immediately stream. So he goes on this epic quest to find the analog copy of it because it's been taken by some rich collector. So, you know. That's pretty fun. That, that's definitely, that's classic Deadpool, um, taking things way too seriously. Yep. Taking the wrong things too seriously and taking other things too light. The last story is by James Stokoe, who does the story and the art. I'm a huge fan of Stokoe's art. Uh, he has that just sort of uh, indie vibe to him. Yeah. That I'm glad that uh, companies are letting him Almost like use... hyper detailed on things. Yeah, yeah. You can really like look all over it. Yeah. So uh, in this, Deadpool visits Omega Red, which you know, Omega Red, he's been in Wolverine a little bit, but he's not in a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. um, even despite the fact you know, he's a hot character. His first appearance goes for a lot more mm -hmm. than it used to. So uh, Deadpool visits Omega Red, who has created his own country. Uh, this is not official, of course. This is up in the Canadian wastelands. He, <laughs> he's, he's outgrown Russia. So he's made his own country, and all I'll say about that story is that insanity ensues in both the writing of it and the art is crazy wild story. Uh, so, I mean, need I say more? That is the first issue of Deadpool, Black, White, and Blood. I found it very amusing. I liked all three stories. We got some variants to show you. The first one is the James Stokoe variant, his particular art style. I, honestly, I like a lot more of the stuff he did on the interiors than even mm. this variant. And here is the Kyle Hot variant. Kyle Hotz in the black and white gives me very, uh, like, Kevin Eastman vibes. I can see that. Yeah, the yeah. kind of the ninja and everything with that. Mm -hmm. So, real quick, don't have a ton to go over with this one, but just wanted to point out that this did come out. This is uh, Suicide Squad number six. And uh, this series has been great so far. This is one of my favorite books coming out since they kind of relaunched everything. This and Teen Titans Academy have both been stellar. And you could definitely tell they are trying to bring uh, Bloodsport in to be a, uh, a big player considering he's going to be in the movie. Yeah. Um, but this is fun because the Suicide Squad are actually hunting for Bloodsport across multiple... Um, dimensions and realities so you see on the cover with the ultraman superman but also what is big in this is and it was hard to track down like all the information on this there is a character that appeared actually in arrow and it's an alternate version of black canary called black siren and they have had they've been in one comic before but just in the background with no speaking roles. But they are actually in this, so I'm not sure if this is going to be considered a first appearance, but it's basically like your, how you have Ultraman and Owlman. It's the evil version of Black Canary, but significant because she has been on Arrow and has been a character um, elsewhere other than in the comics. Interesting. Which is, and she, she's pretty cool in this, so pseudo first appearance. And the uh, last page reveal of this issue is really cool and uh, brings back a, a, a character in a classic outfit that I think people will really like. There's also this super cool variant uh, with Bloodsport. So this is the uh, Suicide Squad movie variant. I think this is uh, Parcel, I think is his name, the artist. Okay, so I read Crush and Lobo number three. I have very good news in that they actually meet in this <laughs> issue. In fact, it's right towards the beginning. I was so happy. They finally get Crush to the prison. Her and Lobo meet. They talk. So let me tell you a little bit about this issue. First off, this cover is a little bit in homage to um, Lobo's back. Yeah. Where, you know, Lobo's standing his back is there, and he has the jacket on that says something snarky. So I just wanted to point that out. The way you said that, too, an homage to Lobo's back, because here's someone else's back. It's yeah. like, no, the series Lobo's back. Uh-huh. 
So, um, of course, Lobo is in intergalactic prison, and he has requested that Crush come and visit him because he's been seeing the robot psychiatrist <laughs> who uh, he claims has convinced him to change his ways and try to mend things with his daughter. Now, previously, this is not the first time they've ever met. In Teen Titans, Lobo showed up. He tried to kill his daughter because, like he did with all the other Zarnians, he wants to be the last Zarnian. Mm -hmm. He's killed tons of Zarnians. So when he finds out she's around, he shows up. He tried to kill her in Teen Titans. He also mind-controlled her and had her try to kill her friends, the other Teen Titans. Mm -hmm. And finally, he left her for dead. So this is all previously yeah. of them meeting. So it's amazing Crush even shows up to, to talk to him. Now, has Lobo really turned over a new leaf? That is the question. What I will say is, by the end of this issue, I think you will know for certain. That's all I'll say. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, all right, it has this very cool variant. It looks like, you know, it's that classic 80s picture yeah, the... variant. You went the to the laser mall beams. and uh, got your picture taken. Yeah, or, or a lot of high school photos uh -huh. did it this way, with you just staring into the distance. So, so that is the skinny on Crush and Lobo number three. If if they hadn't met in this issue, I would have been like, "What are they ever going to meet?" Then it should have been like Crush period Lobo period. It's like they don't meet. It's two separate characters yeah, in this but book. Right at the beginning, luckily they get to it. <laughs> So next up is Sinister War number two. So kind of uh, the not quite the middle of the series, but we're pretty uh, into what's been going on with this because you have all of the villains of Spider-Man coming after each other with Spider-Man caught in the center. It's kind of the, the story of this whole series, but also this issue very much shows that ton of Spider-Man villains in it. And, uh, of course, we're getting close to the end of Nick Spencer's run on Amazing Spider-Man and all of Spider-Man. So, it seems like we're getting very close to the end of Kindred's story, which has been in it since issue one. Since issue one. And we'll say that it looks like he is about to make his final play to get Spider-Man. And we know that something's going to happen with Spider-Man coming up in... Uh, issue i'm guessing i guess 74 74 if not before if not before yeah if not in the end of this then in that so um reading it if you're reading amazing spider-man you'll definitely want to continue with it but uh it's pretty pretty continuity heavy to you been reading amazing spider-man it does have some really nice variant covers so we do have the bagley connecting cover We have the Baldion Handbook variant with a Rhino. We have the Varegi Black Cat on there. And we have the 1 in 25 Gomez variant. Really cool Taskmaster who is in it. And he's got all his witty Taskmaster quips. We we're selling this one for 30. All right, from Bad Idea, I read Hero Trade Presents Passive Aggressive. <laughs> really, this comic could have just been called Aggressive. And notice Aggressive is a bigger word on it. I think the story in it is actually called Aggressive. You know, mm -hmm. like it's called Passive Aggressive, but this tale is called Aggressive. Maybe the, if they do another, it'll be called Passive. <laughs> uh, it has two stories in it there's the larger a story and then as a bad idea does in all their works there's a b story that is totally unannounced it's always a surprise with them um that's some of the fun to reading the bad idea stuff this is written by matt kent with art from david lapham so the premise is it's about a vigilante and he is just kicking butt i mean this guy he's not a very nice he, he's pretty anti-hero mm. he's not nice to the villains he's not nice to anybody um and right in the middle of just kicking butt on all these people that he considers villains, you know, some of them are pretty low-level criminals, but he still beats the crap out of them. He gets an alert that somebody has hacked his bank account, 
You know, and I mean, this ha this happens. I mean, I'm sure this has happened to many of you, where yeah. somebody has has you know hacked your bank account, and your bank's like, "Don't worry, we'll give you your money back, but you're it's going to take so many days." Well, <laughs> he decides he's going to go after these hackers. You know, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Uh, but, Wish fulfillment there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he has he has the ability to do this. You know, he has apparently a lot of money. He has tech. He has gear. And uh, so he tries to do this, but he, he runs into bumps along the way because he no longer has access to his money. They had to, you know, freeze it for a minute. So, you know, his, his phone is dying. It's run out of minutes. He can't fuel his jet. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit of humor, but it's weird because it's not a comedy. It really is more just an action-packed comic mm -hmm. of him going across the world to find hackers to beat them up. Hmm. Um, so I, I, I don't know what to tell you as far as what genre it is. As with Bad Idea, it is them just doing what they feel like doing. Mm -hmm. I thought the art in it was really cool. It's, it's done in black and white. Um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's just a fun thing. It is also one of the final five comics. Bad Idea said they are launching five comics mm -hmm. between now and the end of the year, and that's it before they go away, rebrand, who knows. We still don't know. I mean, we're one of the 200-some stores yeah. that carry their stuff, and they have not told us. But we know you'll hear it from us. Uh, the B story is about a criminal who has decided he wants to get out of his life a crime, but there are several people who know what he's done, mm -hmm. and he decides that they must die first. And that's kind of the premise. Mm. So, so that's what's going on in Passive-Aggressive, from bad idea really neat cool just different is book. it a one shot or to tell you the truth i'm not sure um i i believe it is but it's so hard to tell yeah with, with the bad idea stuff so i'm i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> so people probably want me to get this cover off the screen because it's time for another red room number three one of the uh, most horrendous comics to come out. Yeah. Um, and this is no exception. But what is interesting about this one, this has the closest thing I think the series will ever get to a hero. Wow. I mean, I mean, it's a far stone throw away from a hero. We'll say that. But this actually follows a guy who was in prison and the government, the FBI, get him out because he was actually the guy who invented the software um, that he used for kind of like minor like drug stuff. But now the Red Room uses that software and they okay. can't crack it. So they've got him to, uh, they're like, we'll release you from prison, but you got to work like 10 hours a day on this laptop trying to crack their code so we can find out where they are and we can shut them down. So this guy, yes, he was in jail for bad stuff and the ramifications of what he did are bad, but doesn't necessarily feel like a horrible person, which is a kind of a, a, uh, a fresh air for this. Together yeah. For um, and when he gets out, he learns that his wife has like used all this money that he made from all this stuff, bought a big house, and now he's got like this really nice life. But he is in charge of kind of bringing down the red room, and you'll have to see what happens. I'll say, of course, there is not a happy ending, um, but not the worst ending out of all of these. And I'm interested to see maybe is this a character that's going to carry over to another issue at some point. So. Um, if you've enjoyed the series, you'll enjoy this one. Um, if you're repulsed by this series, same. <laughs> continue staying away. Can, continue to stay away. But I, I commend Ed Piscor for yeah. this. He is, I mean, what he's doing, he's doing so well. Yeah. Um, weaving very interesting, uh, plots and characters and world and everything, so... Uh, another issue of Red Room. It's got a couple of variants. So we have the 1 in 5 Okazaki variant. Very dark with all of our our characters on there. You could call them villains. And then we have the 1 in 10 Piscor variant. 
The one and five were selling for 15, and this one we are selling for 20. Yeah, there's a nice one in 15 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle homage variant that you might want to look for at your store. It is selling for much more. I think it's selling for like close to 80 bucks right now. And anytime someone homages that Ninja Turtles number one, like when Kanto did it, it's like everybody's like, Ninja Turtles, I gotta get it. Okay, so one I want to go over quickly is Avengers issue number 47. It is in the the middle of the, uh, well, towards the beginning of the World, World War She-Hulk <laughs> storyline. So, you know, before they did World War Hulk, now they're doing World War She-Hulk. And what is going on in this? I mean, look at that. We have widows crawling on She-Hulk's face. Well, why is that? I'll tell you why. She-Hulk is being manipulated. So she was taken to the, to the Red Room. The Winter Guard has stolen her uh, for crimes against them. Mm -hmm. And they are messing with her mind. They are trying to get her to change, to turn into a weapon that they can use against the Avengers and others. So that is the premise of this one. But the reason I brought it on the show today is because there is a first appearance of a new form and color of She-Hulk by the end of this. I would say it'd be counted as a cameo. Mm. So you know how Hulks have different forms. Mm -hmm. You know, like for instance, Bruce Banner was Green Hulk, then he was Red Hulk, Professor Hulk. Um, there, you know, Mister Fix It, yep. Hulk. There is a new form of She Hulk in this. Which I, I don't think there's the been. End. There's been what the like the Savage She Hulk that was gray when she had like glowing green eyes and stuff from but she really doesn't have that many forms no. there's red she hulk but that's a different character so so that's a reason you might want to seek this one out uh we have this awesome one another in here glee variant for avengers 47 he's just been doing this great mm -hmm. series of variants all month another quick mention is conjuring the lover this is for number three, and uh, of course this continues the kind of prequel story to The Conjuring 3, um, with that kind of the, it's almost like, not the origin story, but kind of like, how did the demon from uh, Conjuring 3 get to where he got? Well, that follows this. I think the uh, really interesting part about these is the backup stories that have spotlighted different artifacts in the Warren's um, museum of haunted and, and possessed artifacts. And as you can see on the cover, this one is for the accordion monkey that, I mean, you could see that thing was possessed from a mile away. <laughs> it's just horrifying. Um, this one is by Tim Seeley, who, great. Uh, if you haven't read Hack Slash, um, it's actually a really good homage to like slasher movies and he pulls out a lot of that um, horror writing in this which he does very well very creepy um, and the art is done by Kelly Jones which awesome to get Kelly Jones who classic Swamp Thing artist and horror artist in general very much channels a lot of that classic EC horror stuff um, and what's significant about this is and I went back to our shelves, found the um, back issues of the first two issues of this to see. And this actually has the first appearance of Annabelle. Huh. Uh, just in a single panel shot, but pretty distinct. Like, you know, you know who and what it is. But I thought that was pretty significant. You know, we, yeah. we talk about now the first comic appearance of Freddy and Jason Absolutely. and all of those. This will be your first, either first full appearance or cameo of Annabelle. Well, now i got to grab this. And just to see uh, Kelly Jones draw Annabelle captures all the creepy, all the super close eyes and the, the deep sockets of Annabelle. So that is a reason to pick this up. Plus, it's just been a really fun series overall. Um, great concept, everything. And we have, of course, another variant cover. This is the variant cover the VHS box variant so really really cool so another of my favorite reads of this week is basilisk number three in this issue we get more of the chimera and their grizzly powers I see two of them right there so I really enjoyed this issue because the chimera are surrounded by the state police 
And it's sort of what we needed. We needed to see them go up against a trained force of people who knew they were bad and have guns. Mm -hmm. And that's what you get in this issue. Because we want to see what are their powers a little more clearly. Also, can they be hurt? By the end of this issue, you will get answers on all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when, when you come up with villains that are so just scary, you just want to oh. see what they can do when they let yeah, loose a little bit. Test their so powers. them... Surrounded by state police, that is the majority of the issue. Really awesome. Also going on, you have our protagonist, and she, of course, has uh, the ex-member of the Chimera, who we've, we've seen on the cover of issue number one mm -hmm. with the veil. They're setting up the trap for the Chimera, which they're headed towards right now, which maybe will be a next issue. And there's a little more dialogue, a little more progression with them. Lastly, at the end of the issue, and this was kind of a surprise, they um, they sort of uh, have, they expand what's going on around the Chimera. There, mm -hmm. There's a new character with a new place in this mythos. Mm -hmm that I was surprised about. Like, they, they kind of tell you about this person towards the end, and then you see them, and you're like, oh, there's more to it than just the Chimera and the victims. There, there's another level, another group, I would yeah. say. Um, so let me show you the B cover, because this character has their first cameo in the book. They have to do with what I was just talking about. Yet, they're fully on this cover. Like, you can see more of this character right here than you will see in the book. I mean, I guarantee. The character's in the book, but you don't really see all of them unless you get this B cover. Uh, the B cover is by Rice. That's the Rice mm -hmm. B cover. And then we have the 1 in 25 Albuquerque cover with the, uh, the younger-looking member of the Chimera. Which she really is younger. I was wondering, is she an old soul or is she mm -hmm. really a kid? She acts like a kid in this issue. She, mm -hmm. She's a kid. And we're selling this to our customers for $30. So next up we have Geiger. This is Geiger number five. So I always just like to bring up Geiger because, I mean, we have... You know, as many people on this as we do, like a, a Marvel or DC I, I, book. Yes, that's it's very, been a big very popular. Hit, which is not a surprise to Jeff Johns and Gary Frank. I mm. mean, it's your team behind Three Jokers and Doomsday Clock. Doomsday Clock yeah. and or, or Faye Bach was artist on Three Jokers, but Jeff Johns, yeah. and classic uh, superhero writer and everything that you is really uh, getting to flex some muscles that you don't you didn't get to see him do because Jeff Jones has pretty much exclusively written DC for so long. Um, he actually had a small stint at Marvel where he did like a couple issues of Avengers, but this is great to see him taking that superhero genre and expanding on it. But I think who also are the stars of this series are um, Haley and Henry, these two kids who escaped from Las Vegas the uh, the kind of kingdom of Las Vegas with all its weird different rulers um, with an item that their mother gave to them and ran into Geiger or the glowing man or whatever out in the desert. Well, that a lot of them is explored in this one as well. It's almost, the series is almost like, not more about them, but Geiger's more of kind of their bodyguard in this wasteland. And we do find out what uh, this item that their mother gave them, um, what it is and what it does, kind of the significance of it. And we see some of the, um, it's very Walking Dead-esque how, you know, they would be on the road and they ran into like Alexandria. And uh, what are these people about? And it looks like they're building a society here. This world also has some of that, some of that society building outside of Las Vegas um, and are they good people? Are they not? You'll have to read and find out. Um, really cool though. And there seems to be a, the next issue is going to have something pretty big in it. Um, very fallout, like the game, uh, feeling, but a really cool, maybe character will come out in the next one. So 
definitely want to stay tuned for that. We have a couple of variants. So we have the Paul Pelletier variant. Also, we have, there's also a uh, Jerry Ordway variant that we do not have, I think, already sold mm, or already sold went to right. pull boxes. And then we have this Gary Frank cover, which when we talked about on Comics in the Future, we're kind of speculating, like, this is a very odd cover for right. it. This is explained, and it's just more character building about these characters. So, continues to be a great series. All right, from Marvel, there is Immortal Hulk number 49. This is the penultimate issue. Issue 50 is the end of this series. This issue is unlike the ones before it. They're, they're really just letting the team do whatever they want. Uh, this book's already been so strange, so weird, all the body horror stuff mm -hmm. that they've done. This one it isn't a traditional comic, meaning it's not panel and, yeah. and dialogue. It is splash pages with narration by the Hulk around the edges of the splash pages. That is the whole thing. And it kind of does a summary of many things the Hulk has been through all the way leading up to him going into this portal at the end. So what you're seeing here is almost sort of the end of the book um, of him going into the portal with the one below. So this kind of gets you ready. It's almost done poetically. Not that it is a poem, but just the way that it's the, the, the big splash pages and the Hulk narrating. And it doesn't just say Hulk smash, smash, Hulk no. smash. <laughs> yeah, no, not like that at all. So really interesting issue. Um, I We were reading so many things, I had to skim it because there's a lot to read in this one. But mm -hmm. I just wanted people to know what they were getting into if they were interested in picking this issue up. And we have two variants. We have the Bennett variant, which is an homage to a past Todd McFarlane cover. Mm -hmm. And we have the Inhyuk Lee variant, another in his series that he's been doing. And my last kind of main thing before I go into some uh, reprints is this is Green Lantern number five. And I really wanted to talk about this one just because um, one, for fans of the, the kind of the newer Green Lantern characters, especially Teen Lantern, um, has a big part in this. And what's interesting about Green Lanterns is they each have um, their own way of making constructs. So Jon Stewart is an architect, so he builds his stuff in the very uh, intricate and has all the screws and everything. But then you have Kyle Rayner, who's an artist, and his stuff t tends to be more fantastical and everything it's whatever they can imagine we find out in this one what teen lantern makes hmm. okay and it's very interesting it is a whole different take on the construct and it's very reminiscent of kind of who the character is and what they've been through so far um the other key thing in this is a new yellow lantern shows up um and it kind of spoils it if you see some of the covers for the next ones, but a character that we are familiar with um, is kind of revealed in this one to be a Yellow Lantern. Mm. And they could possibly be the best Yellow Lantern, given who they are. And Sinestro's in this as well, and I just have to imagine that those two are going to come into conflict, and maybe we're going to get a new leader of the Sinestro Corps. Interesting. So, it feels like we are definitely heading in Green Lantern towards the future state Green Lantern mm -hmm. and also um, a new, and I, I can't remember, I would need to go back to see if future state had this character as a Yellow Lantern or if this is their first appearance, but they have a very cool Yellow Lantern suit and everything. Um, and just a great, great issue of Green Lantern. If uh, Teen Lantern, we learn how she does her constructs, if she's anything like my niece and nephew, I imagine it's all like Minecraft looking. Because <laughs> that's what, that's what uh, <laughs> the teens these days would be doing. This one is definitely uh, way more emotional with okay. theirs. I'll say that. But um, are you done with I, I am. Okay, so my final thing is Stray Dogs. Yes. We have, uh, I guess, our final 
slew of yep. stray dog this is it printing the reprints and they still don't disappoint there is these are great so this is our i believe it's fourth printing of number one i believe you're right so uh are we gonna say what these are homaging or can Bra people Bram guess stoker's Bram Dog stoker's dogula <laughs> count dogula yep. yes so that is for the number one then we have also, we have a new sketch cover for number one, because surprisingly, the sketch cover for number one, uh, usually sketch covers, you know, if it's a big number one, of course, they'll go up in value like all of them, but really big. People yes. all over are wanting to get the sketch covers to get artists to draw their dogs, um, all that. So there is another printing of the sketch cover for number one. Then we have number three. Uh, printing. I'm not, I'm not sure if I know that one off the top of my head. I'm almost thinking, is it the craft? Oh, you, I think you're right. Yep, I, I see them. They're walking. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. It's a very hard sometimes when you're interpreting them as dogs to see the, <laughs> the actual picture. Yeah. Uh, especially because there are different heights and everything. But this is the fourth printing of number three. Then we have the fourth printing of number... Is this number four? Yes, number four, fourth printing. This was a little harder one, I know, when we were doing it before. I forget which one that was. Do you, do you recall? I don't recall, because okay. I remember it was a little bit tougher. Yeah. So uh, I couldn't remember if you figured it out or Megan figured it out. I think out. Megan figured it out. Yeah, she was like, oh, it's so easy, and we're, we're like, We're one what? person short. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally we have the number five second printing which i believe is not an homage it's just a kind of a classic comic cover yeah you know it reminds me of split a little bit but I don't a little know bit but it's it doesn't have all the like so the trade there, dress there, there's a number two um reprint also we must be out of that i one. believe we're out of okay. it so they... look for that in whatever store mm -hmm. that you shop and there is also a number two reprint so all right well that is our show Ooh. for today I hope that we have been helpful to you. I hope you have knowledge of what you want to, to buy in whatever store you shop in. I hope we've filled in the gaps of what are these comics about <laughs> and which ones have major appearances and why are they important. Uh, heed Andy's Star Wars advice. <laughs> this is also just a great uh, way and excuse for us just to tell each other about what comics came out. Yeah. It's just yeah, a we, subtle way of informing each we'd other. We'd be having these discussions <laughs> anyhow. But thank you all for joining us. And if you're watching this on YouTube and we've been helpful at all, please hit subscribe. Every little bit helps. We keep gaining our numbers. People yeah. keep hearing about our show. And we do appreciate that. So we'll be back on Friday comic for the future where we go over all the comics that are upcoming uh often the first chance for people to see those brand new covers that are just released so we will see you then have a great rest of your day go go read some comics go collect yeah, some comics yeah.